From across the comic book community multiverse, the Comic Con podcast begins now with your hosts, Justin, aka Nemesis Prime. If you give them the title of influencer, then that's that's giving them more power, right? That's how it is. Like, I'm a nobody. Listen, I'm a nobody. Zach, aka the Manimal. We talked about it for a full, I believe, seven to eight minutes on an hour-long normal podcast of our show. And you would have thought we set their house on fire with the backlash. So this week's episode of the Comic-Con podcast is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Welcome back to season three, episode 26. With- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on everybody we are back nemesis prime milton Mantle. you know what's going on we are recording this on june 29th week 26 dude i, I gotta say um uh, i'm adding year, huh? a perfect score on i'm i'm 26 for 26 this year as well oh. as episodes we have not missed a week so that's true i mean I, I, knock I missed, on wood i missed a week right or maybe two i might have missed you two. yeah i missed two <laughs> Hey, you could have missed last week, but I was like, because you weren't going to be able to do a couple weeks ago. And you were like, yeah. Yeah, if you want to pick, I was like, yeah, I will just record early. So yeah, we'll do it early. It's fine. Got out of the way. But I don't know. I think that I think the worst week is going to be terrific con, you know, but we'll, mm. we'll see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> I might have to just pull it up myself. Yeah. Or yeah. we're going to do a live show from a live show Yeah, from the uh from the hotel so uh what's going on everybody we appreciate everybody who's checking us out whether you're new old or been there from the beginning so uh we got some good stuff to talk about some awesome articles probably some stuff that you don't know about and some stuff that you do know about and always talking comics so let's kind of get right into one of our articles and uh, mr milton manuel is gonna kick us off yeah so this is a pretty interesting one i actually kind of i don't know disheartening in a way as well but it's probably a little bit no surprise um obviously everyone knows robert kirkman from walking dead fame invincible uh leader of the inner john universe that's now coming out and over in image comics so um this article is from screen rant and is titled i can't trust these guys invincible creator reveals horror story of working for marvel so obviously you know to kind of preface this when you're an up and coming writer and you hear Marvel and DC, right? Those are like the big taglines. So you mm-hmm. always want to write for these guys. So as Kirkman describes it, working with Marvel was initially a dream come true. He'd been self-publishing up to, up to this point in his career, which doesn't pay much. And then Marvel offered Kirkman a $5,000 to initially do what he'd been doing all along. He jumped at the chance. So Kirkman goes on to say a $5,000 budget might as well be a million dollars. So Marvel hired Kirkman to produce Sleepwalker. Now, a lot of people may not know there was like an epic anthology about Sleepwalker. It wasn't super popular, but it has kind of become uh, a little bit of a like a hot book, right? Like, isn't there a first appearance in there? Um, uh, I don't know so much if it's a first appearance, but I definitely think it's. I agree with you on the hot thing because it's definitely low print run. And there's and some Sleepwalker has always got sure. yes. Sleepwalker has always got that. You know, if it's not a Sleepwalker one or the series, this is always like a a good jumping on point. Right. Or, you know, because it kind of changed him a little bit. And obviously yeah. with Kirkman writing it, which most people don't realize, like, that's typically yeah. what happens. So it's an anthology book, has multiple stories, obviously. And um, after producing the first issue, Marvel's higher ups contacted him and said, and this is a quote, hey, so we shut the whole thing down. You're fired. I know you did a lot of work with issues two and three, but we're not going to pay you for that because we're never putting it out. So Kirkman goes back, consulted his contract and learned that despite being an exclusive contract, There was a clause that said we can terminate this contract at any point if we decide to, and we don't have to give you a reason. So Kirkman goes on to kind of state that this was very disappointing and it was the most unstable representation of what working for Marvel was. And, you know, he went on after that to even kind of work some more with Marvel. Of course, he wrote Jubilee, did some irredeemable Iron Man. But at that situation, after that point, he was basically like, I can't trust these guys. They're not reliable. I can never really look at them as stable employment. So it, it's very interesting, you know, I mean, it, it, it tracks though, like, right, you know, you got the big guys on campus, they feel like they can do whatever they want, they can be like, eh, yeah, you're a new up and comer, you're not like a big name yet, so we'll just cut you. And the fact that they have the audacity as well to kind of come back later and be like, hey, want to come back and work for us again, like, just clearly shows that they it was no big deal to them, they didn't really think it was, that this guy was always going to come back to them if they needed him, so yeah. Um, but it's interesting I mean, for, yeah, for him, you know, for him, you know, when one door closes, another one opens, right. you got him obviously going to image the whole skybound mm-hmm. uh, walking dead and everything, you know, within 
you know, you got the Walking Dead series, you have everything else that he's coming out with. Obviously, we're we're big into this sky, Skybound entertainment with all these other books that are coming out this year. But yeah, I, I agree. It's so funny. It's funny to hear younger writers or artists when you trash talk, like the one of the big three, right? Like typically right. like older guys, right? Like the guys that are way past their prime that kind of just go to conventions that may show up on a book like randomly, right? Yeah. Those guys don't give a shit anymore. But like, he's still like, I feel like, yeah, he's in his prime, right? He's trying to do everything he can. And obviously with Invincible, hopefully coming back at some point on yeah, right. some prime, like whenever we're going to get this season two, you know, he's still doing stuff. You still got the, the Walking Dead series, um, the new one that's dropping on uh, AMC. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of stuff that he has and a lot of stuff that's probably in the tank for him. And it's awesome to see him just say, screw you guys. Like, this is how bad it was. It's funny, too, because, I mean, let's if you look back in time, most everyone knows the creation of Image Comics was pretty much a big F you to DC and Marvel, where it was mm-hmm. all these creators who felt like they weren't getting paid correctly enough for the creation and storylines of characters. Marvel owned the rights to them. And everyone knows that the origin of like the big, I don't remember, big six or seven guys who all left to image and created image, right? Big names at the times, the yep. McFarlane, the Liefelds, the Larson, um, you know, all going over there. And so it's like image has definitely become like the safe space, so to speak, right? So, oh, have you been abused or touched by Marvel or DC? Come to us and image the safe space and we'll protect you. So pretty much. Um, I think it's cool, you know, like. It is what it is, right? I mean, I'm not surprised to hear about it. Marvel and DC are the big conglomerate, right? The big mm-hmm. box company. And that's just how they work. You know, yeah. recycle them in and out. Everyone, they never have to worry about getting writers. Never. Anyone will come take those properties. So, yeah, it's yeah. like a dream job, of course. Yeah. You know, like you go in there and you're just like, I want to do whoever. I want to do Spider Man. I want to do Captain America. I want to do the Avengers. And, on the opposite side, it's the same thing. Batman, you know, Justice League, and people don't. They're just just like, sure, I'll do yeah, it. I'll write. Exactly. I'll get paid peanuts to to write or draw this. It's a mm-hmm. yeah. You put I it on your resume. Sleepwalker. <laughs> no yeah, one said or, that. Yeah, that. <laughs> I'd like to see. I want to. I you know, we should have kind of looked at like where he was at that point. Like, what else did he do? Like, huh. I don't think anything was going on at that time for him to really do. Just just Sleepwalker. I, I just think it's really odd that you'd actually see that. So. But yeah, man, I, I I think if you can ever find that book, you know, because again, two, three, two and three never came out, but issue one is out and it's always if it's always a hot book if you can find it for like cheap because you could always flip it for more because people are always trying to find that. Yeah. What do you um, got? Anything? I'm trying, I'm trying to find when that book came out. Give me a sec. And then in relation to like, like his other bibliography. The rest I definitely think it was like 2000. 2004 is when it came out. So. Yeah. Let's see what else in 2000s he had written or anything before that. I'd kind of done because he was uh, doing Walking Dead, kind of came out in 202, 203. So I guess, you know, because again, in the working for him, was, and, Invincible was 2003. Okay. When it started. And obviously things don't necessarily pick up right right away. Mm-hmm. Walking, uh, Walking Dead. Dead looks like 2000. Oh, no, that was the hardcover. 2003. Yeah. So, yeah. so he's just kind of getting off the ground. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess they, uh, you know, who knows? Because I, I obviously, you know, we're talking 20 years ago. We don't, we have, can't even remember, you know, what writers or artists were like back then. Right. You know, it, it's definitely changed. So, um, but let's kind of get out of um, the Invincible article. Let's talk some, uh, some movie stuff. And of course, I'm a huge fan of this. And I think this is really interesting. So this is over at CBR.com. This was just posted yesterday. So Tron mm-hmm. 3 cast mm-hmm. Evan Peters the star opposite of Jared Leto. So of course, X-Men star Evan Peters becomes the second actor after Jared Leto to join the cast of Tron Aries, the third film in the Disney's beloved sci-fi franchise. So uh, we previously talked about this, how Jared Leto is coming and going to be in the Tron legacy. So uh, of course, 2010's Tron legacy uh, did 400 million really wish they would have continued it, but then it got scrapped so in like 2015. Uh, but they're shifting gears for this third movie being revived. Uh, the new shift comes from, instead of being from the world of computers and programs, it's to the emergence of sentient programs that crosses over into the human world that is not ready for contact. So in the article, it talks about how, uh, Peters is not officially cast as anybody. And neither obviously is Jared Leto, but, uh, it does say that it calls for a soldier in the computer world and an awkward gamer in the human world. So obviously Leto is going to be one of them. 
Peters is going to be another one. And you're going to see some crazy flash. Oh, games. see, I kind of read it as like Peters is both those characters. Oh. He's in the human world. He's an awkward gamer. And then when he goes over to the Tron world, he's the, he's the, like the badass. I guess, you know, but I, I always feel like that's what Flynn was in the first game. And then his son in the second game, well, his son really that's, wasn't an awkward guy. It was. Yeah. Well, you know, and, but you did forget to say when you said Evan Peters star of X-Men, you forgot to say, uh, Jared Little star of Morbius. You know. Oh yeah, that's right. Such a great movie. Morbius. And Suicide Squad. That's, that's, <laughs> that's also in the article because that's where you really need to know. Nothing about 30 Seconds to Mars. Nothing yeah, about dude. like Dallas Buyers Club or any yeah. other like uh, great movies he's done. What Requiem for a Dream. Um, yeah, dude, you know, what's, you know what sucks? is like, I, I do like Jared Leto. I do. Um, but he has kind of, he has a stink on him right now. And it's almost like when you, when you hear him get cast for something, you know, it's like, oh no, like things have not turned out well lately with this guy. But um, yeah, I'm with you though. I loved Tron Legacy. I thought it was great. I, I thought it had just enough nostalgia and, and playback to the original Tron and like mm -hmm. bringing that story along and hat and having Flynn's son. Um, and it was, it's always, we, we talk about this a lot with movies, right? And we kind of talked about with the flash. It's such a thin line where you don't, you can't go too heavy on nostalgia, right? Like you, you tap into it, but you got to have a strong story moving forward. Um, and I think that was what Tron legacy did really well. It's crazy that it didn't, they didn't continue it. Um, but maybe it's a fresh start, you know, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I think a lot of things happened or that were going to happen and were kind of announced. Just poor the timing was with like, huh? Like poor timing, like the, the timing with that movie just or a sequel. Yeah, well, no, I don't think the out. movie did well. I think what happens is they, they were probably in talks at that point with like buying Star Wars, yeah. figuring out like early talks on how to do a streaming service. So like things have to get pushed to the side to really, you know, right cement other things and now they kind of go back right like i'm sure if you realistically thought of like how many disney or pixar movies came out like in the mid to 2010s like obviously like toy story was always there and then it was frozen but there's like nothing really else that's like that stand out ish right for disney at that time and even live action i don't think there was too much i mean I, i'm a bit i'm a big disney person so it's really then remaking all the old stuff into live action like, really what they you know do it would have been better if they would have scrapped the pirates of the Caribbean shit that they were doing. Oh, yeah, they focused on Tron, really you know, like there's so much pirates of the Caribbean. It would have been better if they focused on Tron. Um, well, you know, Johnny Depp brings the money. So God, it's timing though, too. Like what's popular. Like it's like people like us, Tron's always going to be popular, right? Like we're fans. We will watch it at any point in point in time, but there are certain times like you had the, you know, and we're kind of getting out of it. Maybe unfortunately the superhero era of films and, Maybe sci-fi really wasn't a big draw back then and, you know, pirates were, so let's move on from sci-fi and now it's come back. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, it's things go in a, you know, a pendulum, so to speak. So I'm excited, dude. I, I, I love Tron. Visually, Tron's amazing, too. So Yeah, I remember seeing that movie in IMAX 3D and it was wild. And then I think I remember when I bought it, I bought it, I bought a 3D copy, even mm -hmm. though I didn't have a 3D TV, but just in case if I ever bought like a 3D but now you look back and you're like, movies don't even come out in 3D anymore. <laughs> it's just like either Blu-ray or like yeah. 4K and Blu-ray. Like there's no such thing as like a 3D copy. I think even my Avengers, that's it. My, my Avengers first movie is also a 3D. I never bought into the 3D thing. I, never I didn't did. buy into it. I yeah. just ended up getting those copies because I guess they were on sale at the time. And I'm just like, ah, you know what? If I get it, I have it. So Yeah. But I remember going to movies and seeing like a bunch of 3D movies. Some of them really good. Mm -hmm. Some of them absolute garbage. Oh, it was it was very popular for a while. Like every movie was coming out in 3D for a while. Yeah. So Tron, baby. Did wait, oh, did yeah. you give it did it have a date? No, no date. Uh obviously they've just, you know, it's just gonna be um it's just ha it has no release date, but you know, a bunch of people are scheduled. Uh looks like filming is supposed to be in August, uh up in Vancouver, British Can uh Columbia, Canada. So I don't know I love, with uh, obviously with the writer strike, maybe to be pushed. No, a little bit. Yeah. I love Evan Peters though, too. I mean, that guy is, that guy's an actor, man. He can do it all from like American horror story to like Quicksilver to Dahmer. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. He's awesome. So, and there's a great, and, and see like Jared Leto is the same. Like he was great in, um, I saw it on the plane, the, uh, the Gucci movie. Oh Maybe. yeah, I know what you're talking about. I never saw it though. Um, oh yeah, because yeah, he's got the whole makeup thing on. Was it Gucci? Gucci. Yeah, yeah, okay. it was Gucci. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because he's like got all he's like all, he's got like this fat suit on, and he's just like mm-hmm. he's got like a balding head. He's just so funny and weird. But yeah, he's got good movies. But then yeah, there's always that stain that comes from like our like our genre, right, or our community because we're like, oh, he was in Suicide Squad. Ugh, you know what though? It, it, those though, though, it's unfair though too because that's writing. That wasn't him. And I don't care what anyone says. I well, not mm-hmm. I don't care what anyone says. Everyone has their opinion. I liked his Joker. Like I did like the Joker. Is it my favorite? No. But I did, and we've talked about it before, it's so hard to do the Joker after Heath Ledger, right? And I don't think um, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker would have success- been successful if you wouldn't have had like a someone to take the bullet, so to speak, as Jared Leto <laughs> in between, right? So like yeah. Leto had to follow Heath Ledger, which in my opinion, best Joker, I'm sure people will say Jack Nicholson, just like they're wrong, though, no, just like they think Michael Keaton's the best Batman, they're also wrong. And uh but yeah, I mean, I like the take. He was a gangster. He was a little bit different. You had mm-hmm. to do something different. The writing was a little weak. And to be fair, we never really got, he never really got off the ground. You got him in Suicide Squad. You had him in the Snyder Cut. Um, yeah. And we had him one more place, I thought. Let me shut up one more time. Like, I can't remember if he was in. Cameo'd. Maybe in like the Harley Quinn movie. The birds, the birds of, prey? of prey, yeah, like yeah. very briefly, maybe, yeah, maybe. But I feel like that's the only time you ever saw him. Yeah, so three, like definitely not James Gunn Suicide Squad mm-hmm. and nothing else. No Batman. It was definitely just. I think if you would have given him a little bit of time, we might have seen a little bit more. But um, yeah. Oh, BVS. I think wasn't in like the extended version of BVS. He was in there a little bit. Um, yeah, so long ago. I thought. Yeah. There was some no, I think he. I think it's the first time we saw him. Yeah, was. Um, was definitely Suicide Squad. Yeah. And then it would have just been um the end credit scene. Well, end post credit scene type of thing with uh Yeah, the nightmare um, scene thing. Yeah, the nightmare scene. So but yeah, no, we'll, we'll see, see what happens for Tron and uh these two great actors. Yeah. So um let's keep it moving, folks. We have a pretty awesome article, and I think this is awesome for DC people, and I don't know if or you know, Marvel, if you want to check it out. I know Marvel always does these galleries and behind the scenes and they just did the Stan Lee documentary on Disney Plus, but uh, DC is actually coming out with a three-part documentary called "Superpowered: The DC Story Tells the Eight Eighty Year Plus Decade uh, Eight Decade Saga of DC Comics." So this is coming over at the Nerdist.com. Uh, you have obviously with the the end of the DC EU and the dawn of Mr. James Gunn's new universe. It's basically 87 years of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and so many other characters. Uh, there is a two-minute trailer. You can go check it out. It's going to be a three-part documentary series that it premieres on July 20th on, of course, what's known as now Max. Um, the trailer looks awesome. I mean, it's got a lot of people in there. Mark Wade's in there. You got Paul Levitz. You got James Gunn's in there. Uh, the Rock. It's narrated by Ms. Um, Rosario Dawson. So, oh, I didn't notice that. Oh, yeah, yeah. The trailer? So, yeah. I'm I'm happy about that, but it's going to be three different parts. Uh, you know, Zach, I kind of showed you. What you know, mm-hmm. what did you think about it, real quick? I, I'm I'm excited. You know, and I think it I think it whether you're just a Marvel fan and you're not a DC fan, or maybe you're just an Image fan. I think there's no denying that DC is the origin of comics, right? Like for the most part. I mean, like the Superman, the Batman. I mean, these are like the biggest names in comics, more so than any Marvel character. Maybe Spider Man, but he's no Batman. You know, Superman. So watching dc's origins are the origins of comics and they go in to talk about that the code authority and the pre-code stuff which is very interesting um really the only comics still alive are you know are the big two marvel has no golden age right so mm-hmm. um yeah i think it looks awesome i'm excited to see it. you have big t- big time writers in there i saw uh what um jim lee um mark wade uh, who else was popping up in that? You even show? had like obviously the directors like James Gunn's in there, yeah. Patty Jenkins was in there, yeah, yeah. obviously uh, in the trailer, Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> um, I mean, and even in the article, it says you're going to hear from like Tim Burton, Bruce Tim, Michael Keaton, mm-hmm. you know, Margot Robbie. So they're using all these people that have been characters in their movies that have come out of the comics. You know, again, it's a three part series. Episode one's called The Hero's Journey. Part two is called Coming of Age, and part three is A Better Tomorrow. So I don't know if it's going to be weekly or if it's all out on July 20th, but at least you know, we can tell you that it starts on July 20th. Um, but yeah, it's they're talking about over 60 people are going to be, you know, between new and archival interviews talking about the the growing pains of how DC started and then 
everything in between you know it, the art the the trailer is awesome you have like watchmen in there you have sandman oh yeah you have so much that has gone and, and that's what and it's funny because like i said before we started i went i said to zach and just like you got to think about it like dc started in the early 30s or late 30s 40s mm -hmm. marvel doesn't come around till the 60s right right and lee doesn't create all these characters so even if like you look back and yeah they're terrible like some of the dc stuff is terrible as far as writing because that's that's the era mm -hmm. it's like they got their feet wet they did it all so now it's right. like now marvel comes in and it's like all right well now we'll create characters and do storylines but mm -hmm. then you have that resurgence in like the 70s and 80s of dc where like batman became so much cooler mm -hmm. you know you had Wonder Woman kind of changed her tone. Superman changed him a little bit. And then you had other characters that came out of that era, you know, that are just amazing. Like the yeah. horror scene became something. And then obviously going into like the 90s and, and 2000s, obviously. So. Yeah, you got to have someone blaze the trail, right? Someone has to make yeah. the mistakes to grow on, right? You know, so. Um, and yeah, that golden age, that golden age stuff is. <laughs> Bless your soul if you can read that. <laughs> it's it's, it's I, a tough read, man. I don't even read like my golden age Batman's. I, all I do is if I have a, if I have a raw copy, I just make sure it's complete and attached. Yeah. And like other than that, I'm just like, I just can't read these. I'm like, I tried so to pick bad. up a couple of like the golden age, like omnibuses for Batman. Cause I was like, Oh cool. Batman golden age. I was like, Holy balls. Like Holy balls, Batman. I can't continue this. Like it's just bad. I can't, you know, you look, you know, if I'm being fair, sometimes and as, as much of a, like a massive X-Men fan as I am, even mm -hmm. reading Silver Age X Men stuff like the original can be a little rough. So, um, but yeah, dude, like everything gets better, fine tuned with time and age, right? So, yeah, yeah. So uh, again, July twentieth, super powered over on uh, the Max. So uh, Max. sticking with DC, let's uh, let's keep it rolling. I'm sure you've all heard enough if you've been watching YouTube channels and everything else. You all know about the news that popped over that they finally have revealed the cast for Superman Legacy, James Gunn's first official first movie. Uh, this is coming over from IGN.com. So Superman Legacy cast revealed it's Superman and Lois Lane. Uh, we have David Cornswet, is that how you would say it? Cornswet playing the Man of Steel himself. And then you have Rachel uh, Brosenhan as Lois Lane. Now, everyone's already like bitching and complaining and that's course, obviously all that we do course. right yeah. or of like how um <laughs> david looks exactly like henry cavill he does and it's kind of like a young henry or okay. uh, henry cavill but now but. and then there's other things there's other obviously other things that they're bitching about you know what i don't know either of these two act this actor and actress i don't know shit about them so for me it's perfect people mm -hmm. are like oh i loved him in like pearl or something yeah and some horror she movie, did I some think. movie and i'm just like that's great like that's awesome that you people know them but i don't know them so that makes it so much better for me because then when this movie comes out i can be like this is awesome because i remember like when cavill was cast for man of steel all i knew him from was clash of the titans he oh really oh man awesome. he was in the he was in the tutors also and i love yeah, so like i didn't watch it i didn't know I watched Clash of Titans. I was like, yo, I cannot wait for him to be fucking Zuberman. So, yeah. Um, here's go ahead, man. Oh, no. Here's something funny about like every. And look, dude, he does kind of look like Henry Cavill. But here's the, here's the thing. Yeah, he yeah, also kind of looks like Superman because Henry Cavill kind of looks like Superman. So, like, they cast people who look like Clark Kent, man. So, are you surprised that this guy kind of looks like another guy who also <laughs> kind of looks like Clark Kent? Like, I mean, what are we doing here? <laughs> so, you know, whatever. I, my complaint? No complaint. Not a complaint. But the dude needs to put on some size, which I'm sure he's already eating the chicken breasts and hitting yeah. the gym right now, right? These so, people are already complaining, oh, he's not big enough. No. He'll get big, dude. Shit. Yeah, like, he literally just got cast. You're, I'm yeah. sure he didn't, like, get all the I'm whole sure. gym routine and then right. was, like, cast. D dude, Cavill was not as massive as he was um, before yeah. Superman either. Uh, the actress... Um, Oh gosh, Rachel Brosnahan. So I don't watch this show. My wife loves it. Is the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, marvelous Ms. Maisel, and okay. it's supposed to be really, really good. Like she talks about it, how awesome it is, and I, you know, I've read a lot of things that people say it's a really great show. So she's obviously got some acting chops. Um, I mean, what are we really comparing? Like, and I'm not trying to be like an asshole here, but when you're trying to, who are you comparing? Like, who's the best Lois Lane of all time? I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Like, I mean, there hasn't been like a someone who's far and away taken the lowest lane, you know, acting position, like the greatest, right? I mean, we had uh, 
Amy Adams. You had what's her name um, from Lois and Clark. Maybe uh, she might be the best. Oh, uh, the old school TV. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, look. Oh man, I can't remember her name right now. Yeah, yeah. But, no, no, I, I got. Yeah, it. I uh, mean, Terry like, Hatcher. Terry Hatcher. Terry Hatcher. Yeah. So, and then the girl from Smallville. I mean, what are we really comparing? So this girl for sure, good for her. Um, you know, like whatever. Let's see what happens with them. Um, I'm bummed that it's not Cavill, but moving on, it's not Cavill. So. Um, it is what it is. My fear, my biggest complaint, I'm telling you, bro, I'm predicting it. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. And I'm going to lose my shit when it happens is there's going to be an African-American Jimmy Olsen. They're going to replace <laughs> another ginger with an African-American. I guarantee you, because look, you got two white people here. So they already missed an opportunity there. You can't, you can't mess with Clark and you can't probably can't mess with Lois either. Like, like you said, these creator, characters were created in 1939. Okay. So you're not race swapping mm -hmm. them. So Perry White's still up, up for race swapping abilities, which they've done. Yeah. They did that with Lawrence Fishburne yeah. and Jimmy Olsen has been race swapped in the upcoming cartoon and Supergirl. And I guarantee you it's going to be that poor ginger bastard is going to get swapped out. And once again, my people are going to be losing representation. So <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess we're gonna have to find out and see, you know, <laughs> will, will they keep it? Will James keep it, you know, comic accurate or, you know, change it like it's been on like the TV and cartoons over the past, whatever, 15 years. What's your prediction villain wise? So I guess I'm, this is kind of going to, this is going to give my, uh, what are we currently reading away a little bit, but I'm okay. thinking Metallo. I would really mm. like to see Metallo. Okay. He's such a cool character to start off Batman. Uh, Batman. So cool to start off Superman with. Like you don't you can't do a Kryptonian, right? There's no it's point tough. to do Zod. You don't want to do like an alien. I don't think you do like an alien. I think you keep it more grounded and you do someone who's semi-human. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you throw in Lex, obviously. Lex has got to be there somehow. Maybe Lex but... creates Metallo. Yeah, that's or like assists in the development of Metallo. Yeah, I that's I mean, you kind of have to introduce like, I feel like you do have to introduce Lex early. Um, maybe take a page out of Smallville, you know, where they're friends at first type situation and it breaks a little bit. I don't know. Cause that's, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to squeeze all that into to a movie. I mean, yeah. basically the, the, the plot summary for Superman legacy says it tells the story of Superman's journey to reconcile his Kryptonian heritage with his human upbringing as Clark Kent of Smallville kansas he is the embodiment of truth justice in the american way guided by human kindness in a world that seems kindness as old-fashioned so again i i think it'd be awesome to see that because i feel like he's someone that yeah we've seen on like superman supergirl mm -hmm. he's been around but as far as like movie like, so i think that'd be awesome a little bit too in those yeah like, who are you going to bring, like, Mr. Mixoplex? <laughs> I mean, there's only, in my opinion, like, and I think you're right. It's like, it's it's tough to bring in an alien, maybe first, because it's so, if you bring in an alien in this new DCU, it's kind of also what happened in DCEU, right? Like, oh my gosh, aliens came and Superman's here. And now you have this whole world like, yo, there's aliens. You know what How I mean? How do you go you know, bigger? Like, How do you go yeah. bigger? But, like, Brainiac has to show up. And I think... I think eventually they better they need to be working towards Brainiac because we haven't had Brainiac in a live action like movie scenario. Um, yeah, I think that that's a big villain right there. You know, I feel like they did announce that. Now that I'm now that you said that, I did remi Um Yeah, so according to someone, it did say that Brainiac is confirmed as the mm. villain. Oh, look at that manimal just predicting the future. Yeah, but again, there's not too many villains. There's <sighs> not. Parasite needs to show up. Was a good, good, good villain. Um, it looks, yeah, it says that there's rumors going around that Brainiac would be in, but again, I don't think you just can't bring in this like, like, and Brainiac's huge, right? Like right. he's a huge villain. I feel like Modeling he's a build up. Cities. Yeah, yeah, he's like a build up character. I mean, you know, Superman Unbound. You got the super like the Injustice Two game, like with with Brainiac, and just all the great storylines that Brainiac has had over the years, like. Mm. And then the different incarnations of Brainiac, right? So I don't feel like he's someone that you bring in right away. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's also, to, and I feel like this is one of the things that's tough about Superman too, is he's so powerful, you have to bring in someone powerful. You know what I mean? Like that was my biggest, I think I, we talked about it 
previous week on the on the show. Like my biggest complaint with the uh, Brandon Routh's Batman, or I mean Superman, was he was like fighting nature the whole time. It was like Lex Luthor, and he created like ice caps, polar ice caps, or something like that. And it was yeah. dumb. And it was just like because he can't punch humans. You know what I mean? He's too strong. He can't just deck a human, or you know, he's gonna kill him probably. But I don't know. It, you always have to have a big villain or a big powerful guy. That's why I always kind of like Parasite. I just don't know if he's a good leadoff villain. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that he can drain uh, Superman's powers is so awesome as well. Kind of puts him in a... It's tough. You know, you look at Superman, you have the same problem you have as Batman, right? Lead up to the Joker. So with Superman, it's always it's a lead up to Lex or it's a lead up to Doomsday. And that's what everyone expects. How do we get to Doomsday? How do we get to Lex? Uh, so it's tough, man. But I trust James Gunn. He's good. Yeah, uh, I think he'll create. I mean, obviously, it, it's gods and monsters. It's not I mean, gods is kind of where the aliens go. Like that's yeah. You know, Superman's you kind, of, kind of a god. But um, yeah, I mean, the monsters aspect is. Right. I know you know they they talked about Swamp Thing, but you know, Metallo is a monster. Lex is like a monster. So it's all foreshadowing. It's all wordplay. Right. Of course, so. yeah. Parasite could be a monster. Doomsday could be a monster. Yeah. It's all of them, dude. It's all of them. Yeah. He's going to fight them. But yeah, let's, uh, I'm, I'm hoping for Metallo. Not because I even have his like first appearance. I just think it's, it's a good storyline to, to bring him in. So, yeah. um, but yeah, that's it. I mean, do you have any, I think you have. Wait, real quick on that. I'm kind of yeah, thinking yeah. about this Metallo thing. So think about this storyline. Okay. Listen here we up, go. James Gunn. I know you're listening to the podcast. So let's say you do almost like a split story, right? So Clark comes down, boom, the kryptonite comes, Clark's there. And you see almost this side by side story of Clark growing up as the Kryptonian and um, oh God, what's Metallo's real name? Uh, uh, Beck Col Corbin, Corbin, something Corbin, yeah. Corbin, something, right? Yeah. It's definitely Corbin, Corbin, Maybe Dallas, Corbin or... no Corbin, Dallas is a uh, <laughs> fifth element, but, uh, and then him growing up with also like being infected somewhat or discovering kryptonite and like the creating, and he tries to be a hero breaks bad a little bit. And it's like this dichotomy of like both using Kryptonian powers in a way. That'd be kind of cool. Hmm. Yeah, no. Eh. He's a cool character, and he's, he's someone that does stand toe to toe with Batman. So I don't know why you don't. Superman. You don't we both keep Superman. both of us keep saying. God, I keep saying Superman. Superman. I, I keep doing it. Batman. I know because yeah. I just hate Superman half the time. <laughs> I, I kind of I try to be positive about Superman, but I just. It's... I know. Well, again, that's why. Let, I mean, let's get into what are we currently reading? John so Corbin. Can, John yeah. Corbin. Roger. Corbin, There's like three of them. Uh, George Grant. Yeah, that's all the alter egos. Yeah. So. Anyway, okay. Enough Superman talk. Well, um, no, there's not enough Superman talk because I want to get into what are we currently reading with Superman. Oh, but so. I thought we had another article. Didn't you want to? Oh do no, that? we can go to another, another article. article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. can go into that. It's fine. Um, I actually found. Well, you do the the Jonathan Majors article, and then I actually found another article that real quick one should be fun to talk about. Oh yes, so nah, you're basically you know innocent until proven guilty. So yeah, of so course right, this right. week uh, the NYPD has uh, the evidence that for the arrest of the woman who said that Jonathan Majors hit her. So after the, uh, of course, court that finally happened this this month, obviously, with Jonathan Majors saying assaulting him or assaulting her, um, it came out that he is um, free, free and clear. Uh, the NYPD, you know, said that they are sorry, the courts and everything and you know, so the whole domestic violence investigation has come to a close. So Kang looks like he will obviously be back. I think it's um, he who remains remains. He who remains remains. Yeah, that's good. Because <laughs> um, I mean, I was already looking. You know, I was already thinking of actors that could replace him. Obviously. Oh, I wasn't. Um, Ezra Miller still survived, bro. Like I yeah. don't even know how the precedent's been set. So, but maybe yeah. because that movie did so bad that they would have like switched him out. They were going him. Yeah. So. I know a lot of the the Marvel actors and actresses have been, you know, coming forward a little bit and, yeah. you know, talking about it as well. So, you know, they obviously they're responding to everything and saying, you know, how they're happy and, you know, to moving forward, obviously, into the next phases, you know, obviously with the, the final stuff culminating in Kang Dynasty and then Secret Wars. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it would be very tough to replace him when we've already seen him now. And obviously the 2000 you know, Loki iterations. season one. The, the Kang 
obviously ant-man movie and then obviously he's in loki season two so like that's yeah. all done like well and then there was a scene with two thousand different versions of him in like a bowl and you know, all had his face for the most part so. exactly so uh, <laughs> we kind of yeah, know this character you know it's like and i'm hoping you know back to pendulum talk hope maybe, maybe we're swinging back um obviously we were in a realm not too long ago and i'm not downplaying this so no one take offense the me too movement where obviously there was a lot of issues with uh, domestic abuse and, and sexual abuse against women. And it was very important movement. But one of the problems with it was we were in a period of time where people could just make allegations and your life was over. I mean, like mm -hmm. if you were, if you were said, if someone came out and said that guy raped me or whatever, sexually abused me, it didn't matter. There was no innocent until proven guilty. And even down the line, especially if you were like a, a famous person, you were lambasted in society and crushed and then forgotten about until two years later when you were cleared. But by that time you were so destroyed yeah, that there everything. was no coming back. So yeah. um, I, I've always despised that, you know, it goes against our justice system. Like it is innocent until proven guilty. It doesn't matter what your opinion is because your opinion doesn't matter. The facts are the only thing that matters. So um, I don't agree. Did you, did you read that, that the NYPD, apologized yeah the them and the court systems basically there should be no apologizing that's their job no i, I get yeah, it that's it's, stupid that's a horrible precedent we should never be law enforcement should never be apologizing for arresting someone if they were doing their job correctly you know that, that's their job man so well i mean and you know that's that's what it always is too is that and that's always been throughout the you know like when the woman says says something it's always well yeah the man did it because obviously you're a man right like right. yeah the man hit me I, really like and then they yeah. treat you like shit but it's never maybe back in the day but now i mean from what we're seeing is it's obviously with uh amber heard and now this like, yeah yeah that's true the amber heard situation right like it's it's different like, she took a shit on his bed dude yeah some yeah well, you know, happy for him. Um, I, that sounds horrible to be accused of something you didn't do and potentially ruin your life. So that's that's great. I'm glad he got cleared. So, um, so hey, I got a quick new article that I saw. Yeah. Fast that I thought something we always kind of talk about. This is over on CBR, <clears throat> comic book related. It says less is more. Nonstop tie-ins are ruining comic events. So that's something we always talk about, right? Like these yeah. big events, and they say. They mentioned some events like Lazarus Planet and Summer of Symbiotes always have the downside of dragging numerous other titles in their stories and spawn a slew of needless one-shot tie-in comics. Um, they go on to say Crisis on Infinite Earths, Secret Wars did the same thing. Um, one of the big ones that they're really complaining about were the Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths. Obviously, had all of those. Um, I just thought this was a very interesting article talking about how tie-ins are bad for everyone. And... Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that really kind of stood out, did you read, um, God, how long ago was it? It was probably a couple of years ago now. Did you read Robert Venditti's run on Hawkman? The most recent Hawkman run. I think it was like uh, 27 issues. No, I read the new 52. I didn't okay, read so, that. Yeah, second after volume. that one. Man, awesome. And I, I mean, I love Hawkman. And it was just such a, Hawkman has such a convoluted, like storyline, right? Like he kind of always gets like retconned a little bit. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And Vin Diddy came out and kind of cleaned it all up and it was super, super good, dude. Really great. And it talks about how the tie-ins with like, um, da, 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 you're the villain kind of like messed it all up, kind of like set mm -hmm. it all off. And he's wrong. He's not wrong. Cause I was reading that run. And I thought it was so great. So there was that one, um, uh, writer Peter David from Incredible Hulk talks about how he hated being associated with Marvel's events. Um, it's just something we always talk about here. And I saw this article real quick and I just, it's a no brainer, but it's funny to actually see people like, you know, actually write on this for once. Well, yeah, it's always true. Especially like you said, the summer symbiotes, like anytime there's a Spider-Man title, there's always crossovers. All right. Like every spider character needs to be crossed over somehow, obviously with the carnage rain stuff. That's, Miles, Carnage, Venom, yeah. going into Summer Symbiotes. You know, and so it, I, I kind of get, I mean, I get the logic, right? Like the business logic of it, right? You have, let's say, Spider-Man, Spider-Man crossover. And you're like, okay, well, I want to pick, I want to get people reading into, I don't know, this happens a lot, Miles title that doesn't sell very well. Or uh, Silk. A Black, a, Silk or like a Black Panther title or something like that. And then they do the crossover over there. And like, I understand the mentality, but all you're going to see is... Uh, temporary spike right 
in that book sales. And then no one's going to keep reading that for the most part. Maybe you have a few people like, oh, I really like this. Let's keep reading that run. But for the most part, no. So you have a temporary spike. But what you've now done is you've pissed off probably your main readers. Like me, for one, the past like decade or so, I used to be a read them all, collect them all person. Mm -hmm. Like if it was the tie-ins, an event, I would buy every single one. Secret Wars 2, oh my God, dude. Like, or the, the <laughs> 2015 Secret Wars event, like, I bought all that garbage. Yeah. And that kind of was like my burnout moment where I was just like, I can't do this anymore. So much so that I was going to talk about this offline with you, but kind of quickly talk about it. Like, I don't think I'm going to be picking up the uh, Night of Terror stuff. Um, I'm only picking up mains. So yeah. and I even kind of... I'm struggling with that. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't think so. I think I might just say no on all of them and just read them all online. I'm definitely going to read every single one. Yeah. But I, I think that's what they, the tie in thing, man, it, it really burns you out. Right. Well, I think, yeah. Well, cause obviously a lot of these titles that are ending, like we just talked about like wonder woman and flash, they're all Joker, ending yeah. to, to do like this two issue gap and then relaunch at number one with the dawn of DC. But obviously a lot of ones are staying like, action comics superman just recently relaunched batman but yeah it's you know and the thing is too like some of them you do need to like read the current story and it kind of quickly ties in like literally the last two pages will be something about night terrors because obviously it's like continued in night terrors what you right it's like they're in a dream and now you see yeah, them, yeah, kind of yeah, reference exactly. back to the ongoing to offset what they're doing now in a way but yeah mm -hmm. it's still i don't know man i think the worst probably for me as far as like uh, tie-ins yeah. was uh, back in the nineties was Batman's no man land. Okay. That ran through everything, every bat title. It ran through like stupid, like uh, it ran through all the bat titles. So like Batman detective, there was yeah. like, shadow of the bat legends. So there was like four of those. And then you had all like the minis, which was like the not minis, but like it was in Catwoman, It was in detective, uh, uh, Robin nightwing, and then like random one shots, I remember like you'd get them in like Young Justice, and uh, okay, and there was like No Man's Land one, and then like there was just so many like so like literally to read the entire storyline, you know, you were like you felt fixated on like trying right. to grab everything, anything that had that banner that said No Man's Land, yeah, you literally bought it, yeah, yeah. and it could have been like some of them were quick, and some of them were like long, like um, what's a terrible title that I'd collected none, like Azrael. Okay, yeah, yeah. I collected nothing of Azrael until the No Man's Land, and I think it was like a good like eight to ten issues. And I'm like, I'm never gonna pick up anything before or after this. And now I have these eight issues or whatever. Like the only time it's oh, so I'll give a success story. And this okay. is you'll like, I think you're gonna appreciate this. So I traditionally until, no no so traditionally <laughs> until I think I, I've talked about like Blackest Night was kind of when I really yeah, that would have been, like been my next reader. Guess. Um, but no, not that um before that was joker last laugh right so that came out in like i'm looking it up right now it came out in like 2001 and mm. it was it was a storyline joker was gonna die and i remember being like damn okay joker is the biggest villain in comics in my opinion and i still will stand by that biggest greatest villain in comic books and so his death i was like as a comic book person i have to read this mm -hmm. so i was like okay let's do it and i picked up every single one of them and it's funny you say asriel because it crossed over in asriel it crossed over in like you know, Impulse, JLA, JLA, JSA, Orion had his mm. ongoing title at that time. And to be honest with you, a lot of this, these characters I weren't super familiar with, but I enjoyed reading those titles. And I remember being like, dang, okay, I kind of like this. I kind of really enjoy this. And granted, that story ended up being horrible, where at the end it was just a joke and Joker didn't die. I was so pissed at the mm -hmm. end of that. I was like, this is a waste of time. But um, I did like, it's the only time I've, I've felt success outside of, like you said, Blackest Night, but like where I read all these and they had the same thing, the tagline Joker last laugh across the top. Um, and I enjoyed them, but it's rare. So, mm -hmm. Man, yeah, uh, we could go the deep dive on like some of those crossovers is just wild. Like right. the good ones, the bad ones. We should really one day we should just like pick our top three of like best and worst, like the, maybe on our end of the year show. Yeah, or just like do like a random. We should definitely talk about like on random, like pick yeah. up stuff that like people were like, "Wow, they really had that." Like I'm telling you, like No Man's Land was the worst in the '90s, like for Batman. Yeah, you know, yeah, same thing like with Superman, but Superman only had like the four for like Doomsday. They had the main four titles, and then they right. had like 
a little bit after that, but I don't think it crossed over. It definitely didn't cross over into Batman. Didn't cross over into Wonder Woman. Like it was just kept in the family. Oh yeah, that's but that was a great one, man. <sighs> yeah, yeah, it was. But I that's what that. I'm saying. Like sometimes when you randomly throw in some one shots or titles that you know people probably aren't picking up just to get that spike. Like I said, like mm-hmm. Azrael, like nobody was buying that book, and somehow that that ran like a good seventy issues at the time, which is wild to think. But, yeah, yeah. No, 70. I, I was just saying Joker Last Laugh, Azrael number 83. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Good Even lord, higher. bro. How did Azrael go that high? It's wild. The 90s is wild. The 90s, was, the 90s was wild. It was absolutely wild. Like, uh, I mean, I always talk about that. I always talk about, like, how Superman, Jimmy Olsen book, and, like, Lois Lane, you know, the, mm-hmm. like, Superman's girlfriend. Like, those books went over, like, almost 200 issues. You're like, why? Yeah, who, how? Was buy- who was buying that? Yeah, Azrael won a hundred issues and even one hundred. That's Azrael. funny too because I feel like Superman struggles to sell at times. So who's mm-hmm. buying his like ancillary characters, his supporting cast? You know, I don't know. Superman fans because it really wasn't. It was either action. It was the action comics and Superman. So yeah. where unless you're re- there was, you know, I guess you're reading him in Justice League or if he shows up in another book. But yeah, you're always want to know. But I guess because those are main characters that actually maybe people do care about a little bit to right. get that reader. Like you wouldn't have like let's just say like in the seventies or whatever, you wouldn't have an Alfred book. Right? It's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have Robin. Like you'd have a Robin book back then, but you would never have just like an Alfred book. Yeah, but it might be. I don't see would probably be more likely to read an Alfred book than I would a Jimmy Olsen book. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. Him just cleaning Wayne Manor. That's every issue. <laughs> no, nah, dude, he was a, he was a warrior. He used to fight. I know, but like then you didn't really, yeah. they didn't really explore that whole side of it. I know. Yeah, that's true. So uh, different. Well, All yeah, right, we, should, we uh, should, we should deep dive something like that. Some yeah. Point. We definitely got to think about that one, one episode where we're, yeah. we're dropping into all the different, uh, the tie-ins and, oh, <laughs> anyway uh yeah. let's get into what are we currently reading to round out this episode of uh season three episode 26 so um i teased it a little bit earlier yeah this week there was like a lot but there really wasn't at the same time there wasn't a lot of titles that i needed to pick up so i kind of went back and i figured you know what it's been a while since i've read some action comics so i actually just picked up the most recent run since i've kind of changed it over to dawn of dc so i've been read. I, I picked up uh Action Comics 1051 up to 1056, which is the current run. And I got to say, like, they're trying to do this whole... And I don't know if you've read them. No, I haven't been reading so You're not reading them? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, in 1051, they kind of had this whole, like, team building, right? They kind of brought all together all the... And it's also crossing over into, like, Superman as well, because I've talked about that, and if you're reading it. Like, they've kind of have, like, there's Superman, there's John Kent, there's Supergirl, Superboy, there's that Superman from Hong Kong... Um, they're steel and his daughter mm-hmm. and they're kind of like building this team in like metropolis and that's something that superman really never had right like right gotham's never, always like, very well the known family, yeah yeah the bat family is always well known so uh on this side you have you know you have all those characters and the first story arc again leads into metallo and that's why i, I you know I, I express metallo as somebody who i think would be a cool villain and i i just think that first of all the the art done by um Ritano sandoval is amazing like it is just badass it reminds me of like dan mora art to be honest okay very jam-packed very action and then again you have all the different characters so i mean you know i'm not a big superman fan but i've been reading the dawn of dc and reading those first couple issues and seeing the different characters that are popping in like the super quote-unquote superman team like the super family i'm just like i remember that at 1051 was like kind of like a hot issue so i ended up finding like the variant for like cheap and then i just picked up the rest of the run so you know i just think it's awesome because i think again metallo is a cool character who um can definitely hold his own against superman you could literally see it in these uh in in these first couple issues obviously he's going up against steel he's going up against other you know other super family friends uh, mm-hmm. And that's that's really what it is. I mean, I think it's really awesome to see him as a as a character for the future for Marvel or I'm sorry for for DC. And then the other title that I had for DC this week was the Batman Brave and the Bold number two. Now, I'm not big on like all the stories. So there's four there's four stories in each of the issues. But obviously, the main one, which is the first one, is the Batman Joker one, which is violent it's kind of like a a retelling or even repurposing of their first meeting Mm -hmm. from like Batman number one or, you know, Batman two from like the forties. 
but it's just wild. Like it almost, it's like the first retelling of like Joker, even meeting like, uh, Gordon and how he doesn't kill him. And he's like killing all these people, but the art is badass. The way it's done is almost like those old, like 1940s and 1930 movies where it's like, there's action in one panel and then it goes to like a black screen and then it's just like words, okay. you know, cause obviously like silent yeah. movies, like that's where they would have what they're saying. You know that? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, for, yeah, I'm picturing right. it. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I thought I didn't hear you. So, um, but yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. I mean, obviously, with Batman and Joker, their relationship over the years, you know, you you have a really good dynamic there. So it's just, but again, like Joker is just. I haven't seen him. They haven't really shown this violent side of Joker in a while. So it's and like really what, the dark label or black labels type stuff. Probably it's not even like it's not even black label. It's just like it's just regular Batman, the Brave and the Bold. Like, and that's one of the stories. And then there's the other stories has like, um, storm watches in it. There's a Superman storyline. And then there's, uh, one more, which I didn't get to, but yeah, just the, the Joker Batman one is, is freaking phenomenal. Uh, and then I guess the only other two books I really have to talk about is, uh, the, the star Wars stuff this week. I thought Dr. Dr. Afra again is good. Now that they're getting out of this, like high Republic where she's, looking for when she was looking for that artifact and every issue involved tie-ins with like hidden empire. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah, dra- I that really drag. think they're moving forward. Yeah. Like <clears throat> this issue was big. The variant, there was that variant that Marquez variant. That's like stupid money because people didn't order enough for Ala Sakura. And, but it's pretty cool because this issue involves uh, Luke and Ayla in this Jedi temple. And what's awesome is like, they also have flashbacks to the time where like Ala Sakura and Shakti are in there, mm-hmm. which is, nice to see this so i'm ex- i'm excited to see how um they do moving forward if they continue like these backstories because there's realistically like we don't really get too much of the clone wars and right. if we do we get those like main characters so to see jedi mm-hmm. masters and jedi knights that are not main characters is awesome to mm-hmm. see um and then just realist real quick the the darth vader black white and red number three was awesome as well um i don't know if you got around to if you're reading that as well i gave up after the first one Okay. Yeah, I believe me, I would too because I mean that Peach story was just like, yeah. ugh. But you know these these different storylines, these writers that are that are in there. Um, mm-hmm. The first one is written by Jason Aaron. The second one's done by, of course, the new Transformer writer artist uh, Daniel Warren Johnson. I mean, they just make him look so powerful, and that's the one thing that I feel like you never see in Star Wars is how powerful Darth Vader really is. And even in the movies to be, you know, yeah. like a little, there's like hints of how powerful he is. And even in the Obi-Wan series, but in the comics, this series, every issue, he just looks like he gets more powerful. And obviously it's not like a canon thing because obviously it's not part of like the main storyline for like Darth Vader or Star Wars, but they just make him like the hmm. bad, most badass villain out there. So um, those are my picks for, mm-hmm. you know, what are we currently reading? What do you got this week? Cause well, for, I, I liked Dr. Afra, Dr. Mm-hmm. Afra as well. I've kind of been, honestly, the Afra books, I really kind of take a look at them and then I somewhat just kind of skim through them, but I've mm-hmm. been reading the last couple issues and they have been good. And I, I agree with you completely. They like, once they pulled away from the tie in type stuff and, and honestly kind of, I don't feel like she does well. I don't like her supporting cast, to be honest, in this run. Like all, all her supporting cast, like Just Lucky and all those idiots, like I, I don't find them interesting at all. So I very, I very much like it when she's now on her own. And obviously with Luke, it's really cool. Um, mm-hmm. So that was good. Um, what was the other one you talked about? That something else. Doctor Afra, and then Darth um, yeah, Vader, then, and then the two DCs. So yeah. So um, kind of had some hot garbage. I wouldn't say hot garbage, but. And you shouldn't be surprised, but I'm I'm a, I'm disappointed because it's been kind of strong with it was this Carnage Reigns storyline. The Carnage run by itself has been really great and is still great as an ongoing. And then we had like the Carnage Reigns Omega. And this little event was just more of the same, dude. Like what honestly don't know. They gotta pull back on Carnage, bro. Like making Carnage this like ultimate god level threat all the time. It's not. One, he's always going to lose because he's never going to win, right? He can't win. Mm-hmm. And so they need to pull him back. And I, that's why I was kind of excited about the ongoing Carnage because it was like you had two Carnages. You had the Carnage symbiote and you had Cletus Cassidy back. And they need to go back to making Cletus Cassidy Carnage, sociopath, serial killer, ground him more, 
less space, less godlike stuff, you know, less merging with the extremist armor and like the dragon. Like that's it's dumb, dude. And it never works. Um, it's just all this hype, all this hype that just doesn't amount to anything. And it really bummed me out because I know you're enjoying the Carnage run as well. And yeah, same thing. It takes a, in my opinion, when I'm going to look, look, look back on this, this total run, that's a ding mark on it for me is this little event tie in wasn't horrible, but I just didn't need it. Um, I think my pick of the week or honorable mention, I'm really enjoying, but it's not amazing, but I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Uh, Daredevil and Echo miniseries that's kind of going on. Mm -hmm. I think there's a awesome dynamic just in the, the idea of like him being blind, her being deaf, um, characters with similar powers. And then there's also this like backstory and there's kind of some lore going on with like some of the relatives from the past. And I think that's very interesting. Um, so I'm really enjoying that run. And then my pick of the week this week, and it's been a while since I picked any X-Men stuff, but man, the one shot for before the fall of X, it's uh was X-Men Heralds of Apocalypse. So awesome. Finally <laughs> getting Apocalypse again. We haven't seen him since the um, Ten of Swords event and our Swords of Ten. And um, we kind of get a focus on like him. You find out more about Genesis. You hear more about uh, Krakoa and Akara and all that stuff and kind of like how it all kind of formed um, his children, the original heralds of the apocalypse, the horsemen and everything and really, really awesome setting the tone for what's going to happen. And it, I just have kind of liked since the Hickman era, somewhat the switch of apocalypse where in the past he was this alpha alpha, like, um, like kind of bruiser type villain. And since like Hickman's era, there's a very good analogy that they make between him and his wife. Genesis says it. His wife says, I'm the warrior and you're the mage. And it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting to see Apocalypse in this role as like, of course, he's super powerful and he is an alpha, but he's also kind of like, like more like a supporting wisdom, like wise role. And he steps into that warrior, like leader role only because he kind of has to. Um, so I've really enjoyed that. And I thought it was really cool. The artwork was great. Um, the story is awesome. Anything apocalypse I love. So that's definitely my pick of the week. So awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to check out the echo daredevil stuff. Cause I feel like that's obviously leading into the echo show. Yeah. And right. It's going to kind of, so it's, yeah. that's kind of like why they always it. do these like minis, like right before these shows drop to kind of get people like, Oh, all right. Yeah. Build some rapport between the two characters. Kind yep. of, yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Cool. So, so uh, that's it. Everybody appreciate, uh, Another week in, week out over here on the Comic Con podcast. Uh, of course, dropping this, you know, last day of June. Um, hopefully, everyone has a great July Fourth. You celebrate that. Enjoy yes. your Tuesday if your day off. Um, throw up some fireworks. Uh, I don't really have anything going on this weekend. Probably a whatnot sale. Of course, you can always find me Nemesis Prime. Uh, what about you, buddy? Anything going on? Nah, man. Just L I V I N. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's it, everybody. Uh, we'll catch you all next week. Peace Later. out.